Thank you, Tim, and good morning. Good morning, Patty. It's uh, nice to see some, uh, oh, I was going to say old faces. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> some familiar faces. Ah, I've got the right word. Nice to see some familiar faces and also new ones, because it, um, it must be 20 years since I was last here. Uh, I was thinking to myself, what did I say wrong? No, no, no. It, it wasn't that. We returned after a, a number of years of my itinerant ministry. We turned back to the pastor, and uh, that's why we were unable to come. But we have many, many, many happy memories in the old church. I was spanking brand new one now. That's not isn't it? And uh, and then of course I think I think I actually came once here when you were meeting in the school. So it shows you how long ago it is. But it's nice to be here and I'm feeling very much at home and I can prove it. <laughs> uh, let's turn, shall we, to God's Word. I'm going to ask um, if we can turn to the book of Hebrews and we're going to read uh, I think I've uh, got it if I press the right button. That. There we are. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And uh, a few verses from verse 24. Where we read this. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the highest priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. God bless uh, that passage to us. Um, of course, the theme of Hebrews, if you remember, let me remind you, if you don't know, let me tell you. The theme of Hebrews is the superiority of the person and work of the Lord Jesus. Always comparing it to the old covenant, the new covenant in Christ is compared. And the word better comes many times. If you're using the NIV, it comes 11 times. If you've got another version, it may be a different to that, but it comes many, many times. It's better. With Christ, it's better. The new covenant is better than the old. It's superior. Jesus is superior. It's better. But uh, this morning, uh, this Bible passage, I think, speaks to us of what I want us to look at. And, uh, where is it going? There we are. The three appearances of Christ. That's what uh, we're going to look at. And I don't know whether you noticed them here, but there were three appearances of Christ mentioned in these few verses. Verses 24 to 28. Uh, Three appearances of Christ, and we're going to look at them. So, um, the three appearances of Christ is our subject. And uh, so, then I'm going to ask you look in your Bible, if you have your Bible with you. I know sometimes if you have printed Bibles, some people use tablets and phones, but uh, long as it's the Word of God. Notice, first of all, Hebrews 9, verse 24, we read this He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. This is what we've just been celebrating recently. The ascension of Christ after his death for sinners 
and his resurrection, where he was raised for our justification, the death was acceptable and high, and he has now been ascended, given that name that's above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Then there's Hebrews 9, 26, where we read this, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. And then thirdly, in verse 28, Hebrews 9, behind that little screen is verse 28, it says, Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Verse 24 then, he appeared, he entered heaven itself, now to appear in God's presence for us. Verse 26, he has appeared once for all to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Verse 28, he will appear a second time, not for, to bring salvation, but for those who are waiting for him. So there we are. Oh, go on again. There we are. The three appearances of Christ, and uh, that's what's going to be our subject. Where's the clock? Right, there we are. What time do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, let's begin then. I'm not going to take them in the order that they are written here. I'm going to take them in the order that they actually happened. Does that make sense? Let me repeat that. I'm not going to take these in the order that they're written here. I'm going to take these three appearances in the order that they happened. So that means we need to look at Hebrews 9 verse 26 first. And this I've called, of course, Christ's first appearance. And it reminds us that he is the executed one. Verse 26. It simply says this. He has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. This is the appearance or the coming of Christ that we remember, of course, at Christmas. We celebrate the fact that he came from heaven. He who was there with the Father, with the Holy Spirit, he humbled himself, <coughs> laid aside his kingly crowns and robes, clothed himself in human flesh, and came to this earth. But he came, we're reminded, not to do anything, but primarily to die in the place of sinners. Everything else he did, he could have done while still in heaven. For instance, he went around and blessed the children. He could be in heaven and bless the children. He does today. He went around healing the sick. He could have remained in heaven and healed the sick. He does it today. He raised the dead. He could have remained in heaven and raised the dead. The one thing he couldn't do, being in heaven, was to go and to be a sacrifice for sin. He had to leave heaven and he has appeared once for all at the end of time to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. He came with the set purpose of setting his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem, to go to the cross, and to die in the place of sinners. Sinners like the preacher this morning. Sinners like me. And also sinners like you. He died in the place of sinners. 1 Timothy 1.15 said, this is a faithful saying, worthy for everyone to accept, except Christ Jesus 
came into the world. Why? To save sinners. And the only way he could save a sinner like me and you was to go to the cross and to pay the price for our sin. Mark uh, 10 and verse 45 uh, reminds us this. Let me read that to you. Where Jesus says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for men. That's why he came. 1 Peter 3.18 says, He had to die to put us right with God. He is the He is the executed one. <coughs> but um, I've got a question for you. Can you say this? He was executed for me. It is a fact, whether you believe it, accept it, like it or don't, that Jesus was executed for sinners. Fact, end of story, whether you believe it or whether you don't, makes no difference, it's true. I'm asking this. Can you say, have you been given the faith, and only that can be given by God, and you can look at the cross, and you can say, I not only believe he died for sinners, I believe he died for me. That is saving faith. You can't work it out. You're not born with it. It is a gift of God. Ephesians 2 says, saved by grace, through faith, and this, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Have you been given that gift? And you know that Jesus, when he died on that cross for sinners, it was more than that. Yes, he died for sinners, but so that's what we know. But what I have now come to realize is that he died for me, for my sin, for things that I've done wrong. And that is saving faith. You can believe Jesus died for sinners, you can believe he was the only saviour of sinners, and go to hell. The thing that saves you and rescues when you know that he died and was punished in your place for your sin, so that you could be justly and fully forgiven. Have you found this miraculous, that's what it is, this miraculous work of grace. This work that only God can do when, oh, it was Charles first, he put this way, wasn't he? The, 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 the founder of the method, and he said, he found his heart was strangely warmed, and he found that he did believe that Jesus had died in his place. Have you had your heart strangely warmed? We call it converted, don't we? We call it being born again. Have you known that work of God's Spirit? I can't do it. If I could, I'd do it. I can't. Nobody can. Only it is God's sovereign prerogative to save the sinner. To Him will be all, not most, all of the glory. Because He alone can say, can you say, He was executed? For me, he's my Savior. Let's go on and look at the second appearance, what I've called the second appearance, in Hebrews 9 and verse 24. I've called it that, Christ's second appearance. And uh, in Hebrews 9 and verse 24, we read these verses. We read, He entered heaven itself. This is his ascension. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. And here we find he's not only the executed one, but I've called him here, reminds us that Jesus is the exalted one. 
He has been not only raised from the dead, as Romans says for our justification, but he has now been ascended back on high and has been given a name that's above every name, a throne that's above every throne, that at his name every knee shall bow. It has pleased the Father to give him a throne that is above every throne for his eternal <coughs> praise and glory. And uh, of course, he is now, as we're reminded here, exercising what we call his high priestly ministry. That is to say, putting it simply, I don't think to put it simply, uh, he is just in heaven for his own. That's his high priestly ministry. He's sticking up for his own. You see, the sad truth is that the preacher you've invited to be with you again this morning is not perfect. That will surprise you, I know, but it's true. <laughs> he's not perfect. In fact, he's just like you. From time to time, sadly, he fails. Oh, I went to school in Yorkshire, come on, be blunt, call a spade a spade. From time to time, he not only fails, he sins. Oh, don't start criticizing, because you're the same. You see, we're not perfect. Jesus, when on earth, was sinless and perfect. Sadly, his followers are not yet sinless and perfect. We are regarded as such as we're clothed in the loveliness and the sinlessness and the perfection and the righteousness of Christ. We're seen as such, our prayers will be seen and heard and answered. But we're not. We're being made holy. We're in the process of being sanctified. And, uh, but he sticks up when Satan comes to accuse me and says, look, the way he acted to his wife then, that wasn't very nice, was it? So that was sin. He called himself a father of you. And what does Jesus do? He sticks up for me. He says, yes, Father, that was sin. But look, I died for that sin. Forgive me. He presents his wounds on our behalf. <coughs> forgive, Father. And forgive. His high priestly ministry. But of course, what I want to remind ourselves is that he's been crowned and he's been given that place of highest honor. Philippians, read re what, let me read you what Philippians <coughs> says about his ascension going back to heaven. It says, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Listen. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, both in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Acts 2 and verse 32. Uh, listen to this in, in the New Living Translation. It says this. God raised Jesus from the dead. And we are all witnesses of this. Now he is exalted to the place of highest honour in heaven at God's right and yes, he's the exalted one. Come in. I've got another question for you. My first question was, can you say he was executed for me? Now my second question is this. Can you say of the exalted one Can you click it or do something? It's not working. Can you say this? It'll come. And this. Now go back. No, 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 go back. Go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. Sorry. say this, the exalted one, can you say not only he was executed for me 
but the exalted one, he will be a And again, last one, he will be exalted in me. <coughs> he who has been given a name is above every name. He who is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Yes, he will have his rightful place in my life. He'll be exalted in me. He'll have that first and preeminent place that in all things he might have the preeminence. I'll do things his way, not my way. So the problem is, in this country particularly, and probably the States as well, anywhere in the West, we've all been brought up in schools very similar to this, to think sensibly and wisely and logically. And to say, do your best. Think of others. No, that's what we've been brought up. But are we going to say, no, I'm not going to do it my way. I'm not even going to do what I think is best. I'm not going to do it. I will not do what I think is best. I'm going to ask my Lord and my Master. What do you want me to do? I think it's the wisest thing to do this. It seems to make sense to do that. Surely it's the most logical to do that. <clears throat> but Lord, what do you want me to do? And sometimes, sometimes, not always, sometimes what God wants us to do seems to human minds illogical. Look at the Old Testament <laughs> again and again and again and again. What? Just march around once. Next day, again, once. Last day, keep going up seven times and shout. What are you talking about? Then the walls will fall down. You are nuts. Uh, that <coughs> doesn't make sense at all. No, it doesn't. But that's what you've got to do. He will be exalted in me. And how will I know what he wants me to do? Ever thought about him? And stop trying to work it out yourself. Lord, I need to know. I need your help, your guidance. What is right for me to do in this situation? Lord, just show me. And he doesn't play games. He doesn't keep it dangling on a bit of string. When our hearts sincerely want to do it his way, he will show you. <clears throat> when you think this is the best way to do it yourself. Oh, carry on. You'll see it's not. Carry on. But Lord, show me. He will be exalted in me. He was executed for me. He will be exalted in me. But then, of course, there's the third one. No, something's gone wrong with the battery gone or something. I don't know. Oh, there it is. The third, Christ's third appearance. And uh, this, of course, is Hebrews 9 and verse 28. Let me read you that. This is the third appearance in verse 28, where it says, So, Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Now, Obviously, I've called it the third appearance, as it is here, the third appearance, but it's his second coming. And his first appearance, he was the executed one. Second appearance in heaven, the exalted one. And I think you'll obviously know that his third appearance, he's the expected one. He's coming. And this, of course, refers to the second coming of the Lord Jesus when he's coming back to collect all those of his own who are still alive and they shall be caught up together with him in the end so they shall be forever with the Lord. And uh, before he left the earth, he told us to be ready for his coming. 
Let me just remind you, several verses of that these are important to read. Listen to the text 1 and verse 11. When he ascended to heaven, we read this in verse 11. The angel appeared after Jesus ascended. Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. You saw him go, you'll see him come. He's coming back again. Philippians 3 and verse 20 says this. Philippians 3 and verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven, i.e. where we belong is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. We eagerly await, he's coming back from heaven. Titus 2 and verse 11 to 14. Let me listen to these verses. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age, listen, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. He's coming back again. And uh, we're told to encourage one another. But here's the question I've got for you. He is the executed one. Can you say he was executed for me? He is the exalted one. Can you say he will be exalted in me? And of course, he's the expected one. Can you say, he is expected by me. I'm expecting him. Many of us, and here's a challenge that has come to my own heart in recent days, uh, like others here, and more and more these days you hear, I too had cancer, an amputation through cancer, and uh, when they sort of say, you know, nothing can be done, and I'm afraid this is it, chemotherapy won't be any good, radiotherapy won't be any good, you, you can try immunotherapy if you like, but uh, uh, no, I'm not having that. Um, and you say, well, and the thing is, you begin to think about, well, when I die, and when I die, death is coming now, get prepared for death, and what a challenge. And I have to ask myself, am I expecting, as all the medical people say, death? Or am I expecting, go on, stop again, keep going, expecting Jesus. He's coming back again. And the New Testament stresses for his people we don't look forward and anticipation to death but rather to the coming of Christ what a challenge as we get older and older we begin to think don't we of death and how I'm going to die and how it going to be yeah we do but here's the challenge the challenge is we're to live in the expectation of his, listen, soon return. Coming as a thief. What did my lovely, lovely Saviour say before he left? Be ready. Be ready. For in such a time as you think not, the Son of Man will come. He won't think he's coming. He'll be like a thief in the night. Suddenly, unexpectedly, surprisingly. Be ready. I'm coming back soon. So three questions from the bald-headed old preacher this morning. Can you say
say, he was executed for me. Praise him, I'm saying. He'll be exalted in the Holy Spirit. Please help me to live for the glory of the Lord Jesus. Be exalted in me. And he is expected by me. Lord, I look for you. And you're soon coming again. And I shall be caught up together with other brothers and sisters, the blood bought, redeemed of the Lord. We shall be caught up together with him in the air. And so we shall be with the Lord forever. God write his word indelibly upon our hearts. Let's just pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the executed one. Thank you, Lord, for the faith that you've given to many. And they know and rejoice in the fact that you died in their place for their sin, for their failure, that they could be saved and have eternal life and be with you forever. Bless you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you were executed for me. But thank you, Lord, you're no longer dead. You've been raised from the dead and you've ascended on high and been given that place of highest honour. You're the exalted one. And Lord, our prayer this morning is, Lord, forgive us when you're not exalted in our words and our actions. Lord, dear Holy Spirit, help us that Jesus might be truly exalted and preeminent in all our thinking and ways and saying, we pray. Oh, give us your help, we pray. We're so weak. And sinful still, help us that Jesus might be exalted in us. And Lord Jesus, thank you that you're the expected one. You told us you're coming as a thief in the night, suddenly, unexpectedly, when people think it's all fine and calm, it's not going to happen. And suddenly you shall appear. Lord, give us an upward look, an upward vision. Heaven is our home, and we're expecting you, Lord, to come back and to take us there. Lord, 